Mr. College Astronomer, Dr. Salman Hamid, Mr. Universe, here at your Amherst kitchen table. We're kind of giving you the day off from astronomy because we've got somebody from the Springfield Museums and an amateur astronomer talking about uh, Aruna Hill days and the dark skies thing they're doing in, in Cummington so that you can go and do your own amateur astronomy. So we'll let you take a break from talking about the wide universe for the moment, and you're going to uh, dial it down to something that you went to go experience in the North County of the Berkshires at Mass Mocha in North Adams. Uh, that's right, and uh, and I should mention it. It's not really a break because this exhibit A was phenomenal. It and was out of this world. It was out of. There were elements of it that were out of this world, uh, literally. And the other thing is that uh, yeah, there was a lot of great uh, sort of like you know uh, aspects of technology, science, and fantasy in there. So I would love to talk about this particular exhibit that just opened at Mass Mocha. And you went to the artist talk back there yesterday. Tell us the name of the exhibit and the artist. So the uh, artist is Usman Khan, um, and the exhibit is Road to Hybridabad. And um, so the name, as you may start to venture, it's a South Asian name. So he actually uh, was born in Pakistan, but grew up in New York City. And um, you were born in Pakistan, but didn't quite grow up here in the United States, but practically uh, since 18, right? Yeah, and but I did grow up, and this is in quotations, like, you know, <laughs> I really grew up here in the United States. Uh, and, um, and so uh, Usman Khan, uh, he's a professor at University of Michigan, and he lives in the Detroit area uh, as well. Uh, and so this particular exhibit is about migrant identity and how you navigate that, especially with technology playing an increasing role in our lives mm -hmm. and just as a, I, I want to talk more specific about it but a couple of things at a broad level it seems like he loves folk tales and folk tales like the Arabian Nights or, uh, or 1001 uh, Nights uh, and and so there are a lot of elements of that but also other Persian folk tales but then he also brings up movies in the West, because those are also, and a lot of them are using those kind of elements. For example, jinns, like, you know, so people are familiar with Aladdin or, uh, like, you know, and others. So Genies, so some people call them. Genies, yeah. right, exactly. Yeah. So if you're not uh, familiar with the word jinn. Although we actually asked the word nerd about this and she wasn't able to find it. And when people say, are you going to gin up an idea? Does it have to do with jinn the genie? Does it have to do with jinn the spirit? Is there any connection? We, we haven't gotten there yet. She hasn't figured it out, but we're, that's a listener question that we're still ruminating on. Uh, yeah, all that maybe with gin and tonic, but I'm not 100% <laughs> sure about that. Oh, where does that come from? Yeah, right. So, uh, so anyway, so, so yeah, so that is, uh, so he is looking at how identity and everybody's identities are related to the stories they tell. Mm -hmm. And of course, with immigrant, immigrant identities, they have their st culture and stories that are bringing in uh, but then how do the, how are they impacted and incorporated in with technologies? So he has actually quite a bit of a critique of colonial context because these kind of folk tales and identities and things like that have also been appropriated within the colonial context. And he is in some ways uh, basically uh, critiquing that particular aspect. So one of the things, for example, like, you know, that he has a script of Aladdin in there. And if uh, people know, although we would call it Aladdin, but uh, but if people are familiar with that, I mean, it's a deeply problematic narrative, uh, with the original uh, Aladdin that it came out. Or it wasn't the original, but the one in 1990s, um, and things like that, especially one of the songs that was in there. The Disney one. The Disney yeah. one. So uh, the, even, the, even the story of uh, Aladdin or Aladdin and the Lamp, yeah. that's not even in the original, is it? The Thousand and One Nights? I heard that like the first, or the oldest known copy they have of it, it's not even a so part of he it. Actually, there is a, so there is a, actually a description about that, like the sort of like, you know, that where does Aladdin come in? But it has been told many times. I don't remember whether it is actually in Arabian Nights or not. And again, those are collection of stories. Yeah. So There's a thousand and one of them, so it's easy to take one out and put one in <laughs> without even anybody noticing. That's right. And one other thing that I should mention about this exhibit, which you should check out because it is big and it is, there is a lot of elements in it. Mm -hmm. But the name of it is uh, The road, uh, road to Hybridabad. Now, it is a play on two cities. One is in Pakistan and one is in India, and which is Hyderabad. And one of us on, on this table, by the way, was born in Hyderabad in Pakistan. And I'm was not it? going to reveal it wasn't me. who it was. 
<laughs> so uh, so this is a play on that and also uh, he mentioned sort of like you know the lot of the movies in the 50s and 60s wrote to Zanzibar wrote yeah. to Rio and things like that so and he it wrote it he, he stylizes it hybrid Abad. Right. That's As exactly right. Hyderabad, hybrid Abad, which is really cool. Right. And so if you're going, so if I go, a couple of things that I want to highlight. Uh, a, I mean, it's also very funny. I think the exhibit is funny as well. Uh, but it has, if you go uh, towards the front end of it, there is a giant head that is there. And that head is, uh, actually, if you look in the description of that, that is a design after um, Radcliffe. And Radcliffe was the British colonial lawyer who actually drew the lines of partition in 19, uh, in the 1940s between Pakistan and India. Mm -hmm. And he's infamous because famously he did that in, I think, a few weeks or like a month or so without ever visiting or caring for that what is the situation on the ground. Meaning to say he was drawing these boundaries between two big countries that are going to happen without looking at it that the, his pen that is going through the map, how is it going to end up on the ground dividing communities? And that is one of the reasons why the partition of India and Pakistan ended up with killings of millions of people and pe millions of people actually going from um, uh, displaced from one place to another. Including your family. Including my family because like my father's family, for example, they actually thought that uh, they will be safely uh, sort of like, you know, in one part, but it turns out actually the way the, uh, the pen went they ended up in the other side of it, and then they had to go. My mom's family actually was three miles on the other side, so they also became refugees. But And, and that happened on both sides. And, and then, of course, there were a lot of repercussions. So Radcliffe actually is somebody who's not really, hist hi from history perspective, is not looked kindly upon. And I think that is a justified thing. Uh, and his callousness. And that is, again, the colonial callousness that they didn't care. So that's the other part of it. So there's a giant head of Radcliffe in this exhibit? Are you, is it like, are you able to punch it or something? No, like that? well, that would have been interesting too. <laughs> no, because he's a border agent. Oh. And he is the one who is guarding to get into the main hall. He is guarding the entrance. And you have to come up with a password to go in and you have to, it's a tin telephone that you have to say and then he responds to it and whether it would open up or not and the whole face actually lifts up if you have the right password and you can go through uh, go in there and the password also you can actually find that there is a code to it where you can find that but those are also questions that are in naturalization tests for the United States mm. so that is one of the passwords so again because it's not just about the Pakistan and India border but the exhibit also deals with immigrants that are coming in and also the technology that mediates that because you have facial recognition, you have other like questioning that you have this authority that comes in, which decides basically your future to a certain degree, whether you can enter or not. Mm -hmm. And once you come in, uh, you have this uh, hall of the jinn or genies, but it is jinn, that's the way uh, it's spelt in there. And one of my favorite uh, exhibits uh, in there, there is a Apollo lander, Apollo 11 lander that is over there. And on top of it is a, a sort of like you know, a depiction of a hybrid flying horse. And this was, uh, this is called Burak. And within the Islamic uh, context, this was the horse that took Prophet Muhammad first from Mecca, uh, and to, uh, in the same night, to Jerusalem. And from Jerusalem, he was given the right to the heavens. And so, so it has a deep importance to that, but it also is going to Jerusalem, especially within the co current context as well. And one of the reasons why Jerusalem is also considered holy uh, uh, for, for Muslims as well. And here you have this particular depiction of this horse, Barak. It has a, uh, it has a woman's face on it. And then underneath you, it's sitting on top of Apollo 11 lander. I mean, in some sense, technology going to the heavens. And that is the farthest, in some sense, where technology has gone. Uh, and, and, and so that is there. But again, 
I love the small touches because there is also a coin operated thing and you can actually put a coin in and the horse go back and forth. <laughs> like those little horses out like those little grocery horses. stores. Exactly. So, so, that, uh, so, so, so that is there. Uh, the other thing in that particular hall, uh, I mean, you will see these telephone poles in there with sort of like, you know, those sneakers hanging in yeah, from yeah. there. And, um, uh, and which is again, which is something that you see in the urban landscape, although you can also see in Amherst and Northampton. Yeah, my, uh, da- my dad's neighborhood in Boston, I remember as a kid driving through there, I always had sneakers up on those lines. And that has a commentary on a particular uh, Persian um, sort of like, no, folktale, but the uh, conference of the birds, because there is one other bird on a pole, and these sneakers are Air Jordan. And so those other things that are in there. So there is a lot more stuff. But what I want to point out in that particular hall is that there are also flying carpets. And those flying carpets are actually uh, in a cage, which is like roughly designed like a Taj Mahal. Very roughly. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it's there inside a cage. And these carpets, so you can imagine sort of like, you know, what it would be today. And these carpets have drones in it. So uh-huh. these drones let them actually float in it. So these carpets really are flying at Mass Mocha, like with they, the drones? They float a little bit, but, yeah. but they're in a cage. Uh-huh. And uh, one of the things that uh, Usman Khan uh, talks about uh, is one of the inspirations for this particular exhibit. And actually, there is another exhibit uh, uh, on the second floor as well. But, but this one as well, it's Arthur C. Clarke's famous thing, like, you know, that any civilization that is... Uh, or any technology that is sufficiently advanced would be indistinguishable from magic. magic. Mm-hmm. And so this is one of those things that, well, yeah, you, you think in terms of flying carpets, but here, yeah, you can think about it from drones that you can make the carpet fly. Now, he actually mentioned why are they in a cage? And he talked about that if you think about drones, I mean, they've been pretty much killing machines. Yeah, That has been their use. And so he wants to for us to think about that technology like that should be caged and should not be let outside uh, to sort of like, you know, going into the killing fields. And so so that was the Hall of the Jinns. And then um, if you go out from there, it has, uh, there is a wall that actually goes through the central area of the exhibit. And that wall is, you can think about a border wall Uh, But actually, it is the wall of the West Bank. And that is also dividing some parts of the exhibit with the other. But uh, there is a truck down over there uh, on one side of it, which has a lot of speakers. And they have this droning hum music that is going on. Because for resistance or for other reasons too, that you cannot contain these voices that come from the other side. And they are the ones that can break the wall. And so the, at one point, the wall is broken down and you can actually come to the other side. And, uh, and so it is about migrants trying to come, sort of like, you know, across the wall for various reasons. He also has a burning boat, a picture of a burning boat over there, although it would have been cool actually if it was a burning boat, but it is a picture of a burning boat because that burning boat represented uh, the uh, sort of like Muslim armies uh, up in the 8th century, they went from Morocco into Spain, southern Spain, which later became Andalus and Granada and all of that civilization. Cordoba, where I was back in May. But the first time they went over there, the famous story is of the general whose name was Tariq bin Ziyad. And I'll tell you in a second why this name will... Sort of like, if you're not familiar with that, you will... You actually are in some ways because Tariq bin Ziyad led the army, and when he went across to Spain, his army was there, and he burned the boats behind him, or ships behind him. And so the idea was, well, hey, uh, you kind of don't have a choice except to go ahead. And uh, and they won, and so that's the reason how Muslim presence uh, came in there. But in honor of his victory, the general, they named the mountain over there the Mountain of Tariq. Or in Arabic, it was called Jablul. Tariq, which became Gibraltar. Ah. Okay, so Gibraltar <laughs> actually is the mountain of Tariq. Uh, and so, but what he, Usman Khan want, wants to point out is like a lot of them, migrants, refugees, they are crossing the same oceans. They are crossing these 
vast landscapes. It could be in, in the uh, North American context as well. And they are also in some ways, they burn their boat of coming in and then they go through. And in the second segment of that, um, it's a critique of that sometimes when you get to the other place, it turns out ah, it wasn't all like, you know that great. And so it has a depiction of that in particular, like, you know, it looks like the land of milk and honey. And there is a water fountain which actually has milk and honey coming out of it. Wow. And uh, there is a cow. So anyway, so there is a, so there is a critique of the culture that we live in, especially like, you know, if you think about it, uh, you have a lot of processed foods, a lot of uh, there is a commentary on dairy. So milk uh, in that context and a cow is there because there is the cows everywhere here. It's also holy for uh, Brahmins in India, but also the golden calf yeah. within the biblical story. So those are all uh, part of that context. And the last part or one of the uh, parts of it is a rereading room which is spread over, which has a lot of the books, stories that Usman Khan himself had been influenced by. So they are there. And there is Shahrzade. She was the person who was reading stories in 1001 Nights, except here it's a little robot sitting there and that uses generative AI to create a story and actually interact with the person that is sitting there. But it has been trained on data of refugee stories of, of, of people coming to, uh, the, I think from to the US uh, and, and their stories have been gone in there and it tells a story to you. So that's, um, and again, I'm just giving you a pretty light sort of like, you know, that what is in there. There's a lot more stuff in there. There are a lot of carpets everywhere. Uh, there was, I don't even know because there was some break dancing also going on up on screens, which I wasn't 100% sure what that was the case. You can't understand all about art. That's the thing. You got to go back and experience it again. And it just opened at Mass Mocha in North Adams. It's called Road to Hybridabad by Usman, Usman Khan. Khan. Usman Khan. And uh, we, as you have mentioned, um, Monty, many times, I also have strong, uh, sort of like, you know, a channel for astronomy for uh, audience in South Asia. And I plan on interviewing Usman Khan in Urdu with English subtitles. Okay. So it's going to be just like a foreign film. But, <laughs> uh, but, but we're going to talk about that because there are a lot of, to me, the other pleasure of that was there are a lot of references that are not just from the Arabian Nights, but how Arabian Nights get interpreted in South Asia which has its own particular twist to that. And then somebody who moves from South Asia to the US, how those stories actually play a role in there. So it's a, it's a really rich exhibit and Mass Mocha is always a pleasure. I mean, and this was just the one exhibit that I really uh, spent time on. Uh, but, I, and I've been meaning to go and see Laurie Anderson's um, who owns the moon, which we are going to talk about at some point, but I didn't get a chance. You have to, to sign up in advance for that one. It, can, it gets booked out so quick. I know, and they, they, uh, yeah, well, that's a whole other story about that. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, but go and see Road to Hybridabad, and it's a it's a deep, thoughtful portrayal of migrant experiences, immigration, colonialism, and the role that science and technology plays both for the good and for the bad.